Hello everyone and welcome back to another video on the channel. Today we're going to be talking about The Mandalorian Chapter 22 or Season 3, Episode 6 of this series that I've been reviewing every single week. And of course this will be a spoiler review for this episode, so if you've not seen it on Disney Plus just yet, go check it out, come back, and we'll talk about everything that happened in this episode because I thought it was a fun one. I think the thing that surprised me most about this episode was how similar it felt to the first season of The Mandalorian. And it's not that Season 2 and 3 so far have been vastly different from that first season, but this one felt very side questy in terms of where you get a have a fun little side adventure that has a lot of character progression still within it with especially Bo-Katan in this episode but of course you're going to meet some fun actors playing some random roles in the Star Wars universe that you get to meet and enjoy on this fun little side mission that you know has a somewhat satisfying end to the contained storyline within this episode but the real point of it was to have that character progression and have some like fun adventure that you can go on in the meantime exploring new worlds and that's exactly what the first season of the show did extremely well and I think that this episode feels very similar to the episode that Bryce Dallas Howard directed in season one, which was the episode on that one planet where you had that downtrodden village that was kind of under the oppression of all these creatures that were out in the woods. And of course, you had Mando join this little village and he went out and he defeated all these things and he saved the town in a very A New Hope style way. And so that's what this episode essentially feels like. Of course, Bo Katan and Mando set off on a journey to find the rest of the Mandalorians that was kind of separated from Bo Katan because they thought that she wasn't a proper leader of Mandalore. They didn't believe in her quest to reclaim Mandalore and to bring all the Mandalorians back together. Together. And so they've kind of split off and they become mercenaries. You can see at the opening scene, we get to see Mercedes back in her role as Cosca Reeves, along with a new character, Axe Woves, who is the leader of this new, I guess, section of these Mandalorians. And he's going to be kind of the one that the, the characters in this show have to convince to join in with Bo-Katan to kind of reclaim Mandalore. And so we get a setup right away that they are mercenaries. They're working for this one planet run by Lizzo and Jack Black, who are some of these surprise cameos. <laughs> And they kind of run this society where AI and all the droids in this world kind of run everything and everybody else, at least the human characters or the alien characters, all the organic characters kind of just live in peace and harmony without having to go to jobs or anything like that. It's kind of the direction that our real world is going and in our real world it's terrifying. In this world it looks kind of fun and it terrifies me even more that that might be the direction that our world is going. But that's all besides the point with how terrifying AI is and just... God, I'm scared about all that. But that is besides the point because some of these droids are actually malfunctioning and they're causing them to either attack people or do weird random things like throw trash in the air, which I found pretty humorous in this episode as well. But you really get to dive into Din Djarin's especially fear, or not really fear of droids, but distrust of droids. And I think this is the first episode so far this season where you really get to see the, I guess, character quirks that Mando has that we fell in love with, especially in that first season. And he finally had character traits and some interesting personality in this season, which I think has been greatly lacking throughout this entire season so far and I still wish he had more to do in terms of his arc and his character within this season but I at least got some of it in this episode and it was more than what we've gotten so far so I was very happy to see all of that sort of quirkiness in terms of the droid situation that was happening in this episode and I thought maybe for a second that they were going to find that part that will go with you know the IG-88 or IG-11 I always forget his actual name but I think that his entire storyline was abandoned because he found R5 in episode 2 but that's all besides the point because we get to see Din Djarin interact with all the battle droids in this episode of course they were all in the prequels of Star Wars and yes they were annoying in the prequels but I think they were used pretty well well in this episode. I love the chase sequence where they're chasing down that battle droid, which I honestly think they used some motion capture for this for this sequence because of the way the droid was moving was was very good. I think the CGI of all this stuff that was happening in this episode, this chase through the neon-soaked city streets of this entire planet that we've never seen before was a lot of fun, and so I enjoyed all the little action bits in this episode, but when it comes to the actual plot of what happens with why these droids are actually malfunctioning, it all ties into Christopher Lloyd's character who is also in this episode, which of course it's always great to see Christopher Lloyd in literally anything and of course he was the one behind all the droid malfunctions he had these nanobots essentially causing them to malfunction to do all these things because he is a separatist at heart he has all these political ideologies and he kind of praises Count Dooku in this episode before Bo-Katan shoots him with a little zappy thing and turns him into Jack Black and Lizzo in this episode and I think the ending and the resolution of this storyline was not nearly as satisfying as say that episode that's that's Bryce Dallas Howard directed in that first season because once that town was liberated he felt so strongly about it but of course this was all just a means to an end 
to get to all the other Mandalorians to try to convince them to go along with Bo-Katan. And once Din Djarin and Bo-Katan get over to the other Mandalorians, of course, Bo-Katan has to try to challenge this Axe Wolves guy to be able to gain the trust and the, I guess, praise of all these other Mandalorians because that's how Mandalorians do things. They just fight it all out. And of course, Bo-Katan is going to beat this guy up. The action sequence was pretty fun here. And I think this Axe Wolves guy, if they have some more stuff in him throughout this, the rest of the season, I think he's pretty interesting in terms of a character. Of course, that distrust that he has with Bo-Katan kind of reminds me of Paz Vizsla with, with Din Djarin's character. And so I think they have that sort of similar dynamic between each other. But the real revelation in this episode is the fact that she has to get the trust of these Mandalorians, but they still think that she needs to have the Darksaber in order to actually rule Mandalore. That's a thing that needs to happen. And I thought for a second that we we're going to get Din Djarin challenge Bo-Katan so she can finally beat him up and take the Darksaber. But there's a little technicality that reminded me a lot of Harry Potter when it comes to the Elder Wand, which that's always a storyline that bothered me in Harry Potter because I guess Harry just wrestled the wand out of out of Malfoy's hands and that kind of was the duel between those two that was him disarming him in that but in terms of this episode we get to see that when Din Djarin was captured by that one really cool like creepy creature in that first or I think the second episode of the season and he lost the Darksaber to that creature and then Bo-Katan came to save him and took the Darksaber and killed that other creature she actually won the Darksaber in combat there and if you go back to my review of that episode I actually say and that's that you get to see Bo-Katan really utilize the Darksaber in a way that feels like she deserves it over Din Djarin and although this show is the Mandalorian and all-star with Din Djarin, Bo-Katan is a character that I've been following since the Clone Wars that is such an interesting character and I think that she does and she has earned the right to rule Mandalore after all of this time and I think her arc throughout this entire season has been very satisfying and I do kind of wish at some point that she actually fought Din Djarin but at the same time the way this season has gone out and the way that it's kind of bring all the Mandalorians together instead of you know fighting against each other to try to steal power from each other which has been what they've done in the Clone Wars show since the very beginning and that's kind of what divided them from the very start of the entire conflict with the Mandalorians, it feels more right for it to end in this manner where he gives up the Darksaber and says that, you know, he actually lost it by a technicality in that scene. So the end of the episode is Bo-Katan wielding the Darksaber, having a new fleet of Mandalorians that are going to be brought back to Navarro. Ideally, I think that's essentially what's going to happen. And now they have a chance to reclaim Mandalore. And there's still the, the hanging thread of whatever Moff Gideon is doing. So maybe we're going to be introduced or reintroduced to Moff Gideon in the next episode to see exactly what they are planning. And of course, we didn't get any resolution to that shard of Mandalorian armor that was in the, the ship that Moff Gideon escaped from. And I still think that it is a plant by Moff Gideon to make them think, the, to make the New Republic think that the Mandalorians are working with him, therefore pitting the, the New Republic against the Mandalorians on Navarro. I think that's the direction that they're going because at first when they were mercenaries at the beginning of this episode, I thought that maybe they were hired by Moff Gideon. We'd see Moff Gideon in this episode, but that is definitely not the case. So I do definitely think that Moff Gideon is trying to frame the Mandalorians in the eye of the New Republic. That is still my prevailing theory and I think that is what we're going to handle in the next two episodes. And really the last thing I want to talk about in this episode was that fish romance scene at the very beginning of the episode which was just, god it was something else. Who cares about fate? I love you and I will always love you. So that'll be my review for this episode of The Mandalorian. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel and also check out all my other reviews that I've done for The Mandalorian so far this season. I love talking about this show and I'm very excited to talk about the next two episodes of the show along with other movies I'm reviewing off on the side. I actually watched the 1993 Mario movie, the live action adaptation of the Mario games just a few days ago on April 1st. It was my April Fool's Day joke and I love how that video turned out so definitely go check that one out along with the actual review for the Mario movie that just came out in theaters today. So definitely go check out these reviews, subscribe to the channel, leave a like on this video if you did enjoy it, and comment down below, of course, what you thought of this episode of The Mandalorian. So thanks everybody for watching, and I hope to see you all in my next one.